Hi everyone, my name is Ophir uh, Lindenbaum and I'm going to talk about our work on local conformal autoencoders. This is a joint work with Erez Petterfreund, Felix Dietrich, Tom Bertolan, Matan Gavish, Yanis Korbekidis, and Ronald Kaufman. Uh, I'm from Yale University. So the problem that we're going to discuss today is a very general setting uh, where we're considering some physical system that we're trying to study. We're going to use a measurement device and using samples from the, this measurement device, we're going to apply data science to study properties of the physical system. Specifically for the physical system, we're considering a path connected latent manifold, which we're going to denote as X, which is a subset of our lowercase d. In this example, I'm showing a coronavirus that is traveling on a cell surface. And what we want to do is to study the structure of the cell surface, specifically the manifold in this case, based on some measurements. The measurements are created by an observation function which is modeled as a deformorphism F. That's a function from our lowercase d to our capital D. Our goal is given observations from Y, which is the push forwards states of the system from X through the function F. We're asking, can we recover X? So in this example on the left, we have a latent domain X. This is the manifold. This is the cell surface. It's just a square in this case. And we observe different states on this square, different locations. They, after applying a function, this measurement function F, which here is just placing the square on a patch of the unit sphere. So this function is invertible. It is a deformorphism. And using these samples in R3, can we perfectly recover X, which is in R2? So in general, the answer to this question is no, we can't do this. Uh, perhaps we can do it with some prior knowledge on X. Perhaps we can use some prior knowledge on F. Uh, one very simple example is in, if F is linear, then we can try to embed the data in the lower dimension, lowercase d, and attempt to recover the original uh, latent domain x. There are several methods for embedding data uh, from higher dimensions to lower dimensions. Uh, specifically, there are linear methods like PCA, MDS, kernel methods like Laplacian eigenmaps, diffusion maps, or differentiable methods like for autoencoders, variational autoencoders, TCNE, and UMAP. Here I'm demonstrating the application of three of those methods on the example from the previous slides. And you can see that reducing the patch from three dimensions to two dimension still may maintains some of the structure, but it's not perfectly recovering the structure of X, which was a square. So you can see that all the methods have different deformations. They recover a slightly different structure. And that is because they all try to preserve properties of Y and not properties of X. And so they can not be able to answer our goal, which is to, to perfectly recover X. All right. So uh, like, like I said previously, it's, it's currently not possible to, to, to find an embedding to recover X, but uh, Singer and Koifman in 2009 suggested an idea that helps uh, recover the, the latent domain. The idea is that you, you can think of it as somewhat of a prior on X. Specifically, the prior is that at each state of the system, we're not only sampling the point, we're sampling a small burst around it. That small burst 
can be thought of as a random walk around each location. So I can think of one coronavirus and that's taking small perturbation or small random walks around the initial location. And all of those small perturbations are measured in the observation space after pushing forward these perturbation through Y, through F, sorry. So we can think of this random walk as a small Gaussian around the original point, and we can think of the push forward point as a random variable defined by Yi, which is F applied to the location Xi plus the random variable capital Xi. All right, so how does this help us? Uh, so Singer and Koifman use this to suggest an anisotropic diffusion map method for dimensionality reduction. Uh, their application was independent component analysis. The method can be described by the following steps. You define a pseudo inverse of the co covariance matrix of YI. So you compute the empirical covariance matrix of the observed samples from YI. You take the pseudo inverse, and then you compute an anisotropic diffusion kernel, which uses a local Mahalanobis matrix defined by this expression with both of the empirical covariances, CI and CJ, both of the pseudo inverses. Then using the normalized Laplacian, they use the eigenvectors to embed the data. Here, I'm showing an example of embedding that three-dimensional patch on a unit sphere into R2. And you can see that using this method, you get something which is much more coherent with the structure of the square. The color is one of the coordinates of the original square. So you can see that the X coordinate here, phi one is pretty much correlated with the original X one. But there is a boundary effect there is some sparseness in the middle, and that is uh, something inherent to this spectral method. You can ask, when is this uh, sort of a prior applicable in real examples? So I want to uh, mention a few uh, follow-up works that follow the Singer and et al and uh, use this burst sampling procedure for uh, real applications. So both in, in, in their original paper and, and then in a follow-up by De Silva et al, uh, this method was used for studying stochastic dynamics by looking at SDEs. And uh, this was also used for single site localization, both using audio signals and Wi-Fi signals and also for uh, reconstruction of cracks by using uh, audio signals. So you have, uh, in, in all of these examples, the perturbations were created by uh, in a, a small array of antennas around a specific location. And that's what's creating the sort of random walk uh, sampling procedure. So our goal is to be able to find an embedding that is isometric to X. Uh, there has been work on isometric embeddings, for example, Tenenbaum et al. and McQuita et al. But again, they're, they're focused on finding an embedding that is isometric to Y using a different dimension, but not isometric to X. So the setting is slightly different. All right, so let's define our goal explicitly is to learn an embedding function rho such that rho composed with F is isometric to the inaccessible latent domain X. All right, in Euclidean setting, this means that we want that for any pair of points in the space that we observe Y, the distance after applying this embedding function, the distance in rho applied to YI minus rho applied to yj is exactly equal to the distance between these two inaccessible points in the latent domain x. So the distance between xi and xj. 
we can use Taylor expansion to rewrite this expression. After neglecting higher order terms, we can write this as the Jacobian of rho composed with F applied to Xi transpose multiplied by the Jacobian of rho composed with F on Xi is equal to the identity matrix of dimension D. That is the dimension in the latent inaccessible domain. And so uh, this you know, objective, also the original one, are still not very useful because they require access to X for evaluating rho. So for given a hypothesis rho, if I want to evaluate if it's good, I have to get access to X to use this objective. However, um, now we can use the Burr sampling scheme and this lemma by looking at rho decompose F applied to the random variable X, this is the same Gaussian that I showed before. And once I look at the covariance of the push forward random variable, so that's X push forward through F, push forward through rho, if I look at that covariance divided by sigma squared and, and take sigma to zero, if sigma is very small, then this expression tends to the Jacobian of rho composed with F multiplied by the Jacobian of rho composed with F transpose, right? What this means is that locally, we're thinking of the transformation as a linear transformation. And if locally that composition of transformation can be thought of a linear transformation, then we have a way to evaluate the transformation locally based on the covariance of the observed random variable yi. All right, then if the embedding dimension that we're gonna use k is equal to the latent space dimension, we can rewrite this expression in the following way uh, by think, using the, the expression from the previous slide. And then we get the equality that the covariance of the observed random variable y pushed forward through rho divided by sigma squared should be equal to the identity matrix. All right, and this is something we can evaluate because we're observing rho and, uh, sorry, we're observing y and we're trying to learn rho so we can try to impose this objective to learn rho. All right, how we're gonna do that, specifically we'll define the following objective is that at any observed, for any observed random variable yi, we observe it at a different location of the space, we're gonna impose the objective using the empirical covariance, uh, and we're gonna sum the Frobenius norm of the covariance divided by sigma minus the identity. So we're averaging over all of the different random variable, the different bursts that we're sampling. And this is a way to evaluate how well our embedding row is doing in uh, following this property that is required from an isometric embedding that is looking at these sort of bursts. However, we're adding a second objective. The second objective stems from the fact that if rho, if f is invertible and we're looking for rho that is the inverse of f, that means that rho should be invertible as well. And that means we can define in a second objective, which is on a, another function gamma, which tries to recovers, recover y back, that is invert rho. So here, this is just a reconstruction loss. So we've embedded y using rho, and now we're trying to reconstruct y back using y, but looking at all of the samples and all of the samples within the burst. So looking at all the n's and all the m's within the, the m samples within the burst. Uh, so these two losses can be thought of as an autoencoder. Specifically, it's a special type of autoencoder, which we call local conformal autoencoder. And this local conformal autoencoder is observing samples and bursts like you see on the top left part here, the bursts are these small ellipses, which can be thought of as 
heated points on a surface using the laser. And then each burst is pushed forward through the encoder, which is parameterized by Bo. It's a, we use a neural network to parameterize this. And then uh, in the latent, in the, in the embedding space, we're trying to make this ellipse a circle. So we're trying to make it isotropic. And then we're pushing it back through the decoder to make it an ellipse back and place it exactly where it was in the original uh, observed space. So altogether, these two encode, this pair encoder decoder are trained by first taking a gradient step from the encoder using the what we call whitening loss, and then taking step through the decoder and encoder using what we call a reconstruction loss. All right, let's see an example of a result of applying LOCA to the um, deformation of the square. Uh, again, using the same uh, function that we used before, but here in R2. So the latent the, the manifold is on the left, it's a square. However, we only observe a uh, strip from the square. We observe the, the band that is within the uh, black line and outside of the green line. We observe this on the right, on the observation space. We see a deformation of the square on the left. Then we use those samples as training. We train the autoencoder to both whiten the, the burst and, and also reconstruct. And then we're gonna push in the encoder decoder pair, the interpolation part, everything within the, the green line and extrapolation line, everything outside of the black line. On the left, we can see that the embedding is almost perfectly isometric to the original space. You can see that the square has been recovered with very slight deformation on the edges. I, we've also pushed forward the straight lines to see the deformations on the interpolation part and on the extrapolation edge. Then we're also looking at evaluating the isometric property by comparing the distances in the embedding space to the latent space. Again, this is not, not something we can use in training. It's just something we're using for evaluation. So we're comparing these distances and, you, and we can see that the uh, comparison is almost is almost one to one. And it's very similar for interpolation, extrapolation, and this sort of uh, extrapolation. Uh, sorry, and in the frame. Um, next, we move to a, a more challenging example where the actual latent domain lies in a higher dimension than the observation space. So this is very different than what we used to in dimensionality reduction. Here, the deformation is really a snapshot. We're looking at a latent manifold that is this sphere the burst are these small uh, Gaussians around states on the sphere. There's a, there's a hole in the North Pole, sorry, there's a hole in the North Pole and in the South Pole that we're gonna use the South Pole for evaluating interpolation. Then we project the data using F into a plane. That is a um, projection from R3 to R2. And, uh, we use this projected data, which you can see on the right, that's the observation space, to try to recover the latent space from this observation space, right? So uh, you can see on the right that these original circles on R still look like circle, but with different sizes. So now we're training the model to, to just widen each of them to have the same standard deviation and we're gonna evaluate the structure that we observe. All right, so here is the embedding that we get on the left with the push forward uh, interpolation part, that is the uh, North Pole, sorry, South Pole. And you can see here on the right, the isometric property of loca within the frame in green and interpolation in red. 
uh, you can also see a application of just diffusion maps and anisotropic diffusion map, which we described before, which is doing not so bad in this case, but has some boundary effect and sparseness in the, in the middle. Um, next, I, I want to move on to applications of the method. To motivate some of the application, I'll, I'll point out some works uh, that have uh, looked at these applications with different approaches, different methods, uh, specifically at estimating a shape deformation. Uh, the paper by Hein et al. used this uh, patches that they print on the shape to recover the deformation of a 2D object in 3D. Also, uh, Wi-Fi localization by Jaffe et al. Uh, that looked at uh, an antenna array that is moving using a robot, for example, or an individual, censoring a Wi-Fi signal to learn the structure of a, a floor plan of a, of a room. And also an application of ma matching multiple modalities. So you can think of two modalities observing the brain and different uh, uh, transformations, different shifts in the 2D plane, which we're gonna try to embed coherently to be able to match the two uh, translation. This was uh, studied by Simonovsky et al. in 2016. All right, so for the first application, what we did is we printed this object on the left. We observed this image. This is a uh, A4 page, which we printed on very small Gaussians on a square. And then we take this page and we just squish it to get this 3D surface. So a part of a plane just, a part of the page just uh, rises up. We observe it as, as an image. We apply some simple image processing to identify the burst. Specifically, we apply clustering by DV scan that identifies the different bursts, the different Gaussians. We get the clusters on the the, the right, that's the identity of the, the Gaussians. This is an estimation, so it has some errors. Then we push that forward through the uh, local conformal autoencoder. And what we get is these uh, reconstructed part on the left, that is the original and push forward points on the left, and the latent, the original latent square and recovered square which is uh, here um, very close to the original, but it suffers from the, some deformation on the right top corner and, and bottom left corner. Um, so, so this again is a, a, a just a you know, illustrative example of the potential application of a loca for shape deformation. Uh, the next application we tried was Wi-Fi localization. In this example, we took a floor plan from the MI, from MIT, and we placed seventeen um, Wi-Fi transmitter, and then we we measured them with a circle or Wi-Fi sensor antenna at several locations uh, around the room around the floor plan. This is a simulation, so we simulate the signal strength by using the decaying uh, um, transfer function. And using this observed signal or observed six dimensional burst, we embed the data in two dimensions and we look at the embedding and overlay it on the original floor plan. So on the right, we can see that the learned embedding, again, using the Six, six dimensional Wi-Fi signals embedded in R2 is very much with agreement with the original floor plan. You can see that by the green boundary overlaid on the black boundary. Uh, as a next application, we generate two modalities. Here we're looking at uh, matching multiple modalities with, with small translations. So we look at two modalities, each of which is generated by looking at one digit from MNIST dataset, 
which is shifted in both directions. So we're moving it in the x axis, in the horizontal uh, uh, axis and the vertical using a grid of points. And around each grid point, we take a small perturbation using a Gaussian of translations. And we push that forward through LOCA and we look at the embedding. So the observation sp uh, space is 784 dimensional and we're embedding it in two dimensions. All right, so here you can see the embedding coordinates of a subset of the samples. These are the grid locations. On each grid location, we're printing or plotting the, the input image pushed forward through the encoder-decoder encoder, encoder, pair and reconstructed as the original image. And you can see here that the uh, Reconstructive quality is good. That is the, the, the image is very close to the original image. And also that the location on the grid correlates with the translations on the, uh, that we have applied to the original images. So these embedding are correlated with the actual latent coordinates and also correlated between the two embeddings. So it allows us to calibrate the two. These are applications of two different separate trained neural networks that we are calibrating using an orthogonal transformation and we're plotting this after uh, uh, this uh, orthogonal transformation. Um, here we can see in the middle the calibration of the two modalities overlaid so you can see they're uh, well, well calibrated and on the left we've attempted to do the exact same thing using a standard order encoder. So we're just removing this widening loss and training a standard order encoder. What this demonstrates is that the standard order encoder, even though it's able to reconstruct the original image with a good quality and also find an embedding that is somewhat related to the latent coordinates, it's not isometric to the latent coordinates in the sense that this does not have a grid structure. It's, it does not, uh, uh, it, it is not isometric to a square. And also it's not consistent between the two modalities. All right, on the right, we can see the comparison between distances with mod the different modalities and the different, the latent domain X, which is the original translations. As a last example, we want to consider a stochastic dynamical Lorentz system. Here it's a uh, simple Lorentz system, but with an additional term, which has W1, W2, W3, which could be thought as, as a uh, small um, random walk. Uh, so these are random walk steps. These are isometric noise in this latent domain of the Lorentz system. The Lorentz system is parameterized by sigma rho and beta. And, and we observe it using this nonlinear function um, y, which has six Legendre polynomials, polynomials, and it has nonlinearities, specifically uh, x1 to the power of three and x2 to the power of three and x3 to the power of three. You can see on the left the latent space, which is the trajectory of the Lorentz system colored by time. And on the right, you can see the observation space. So the dimension is 10 dimensional and time is on the X axis. And the height is in the, uh, the value is in the Z axis. So we observe that we push forward that through LOCA where the bursts are, observed, are here measured by looking at small time steps. And we can see the embedding here is coherent with the uh, uh, trajectory of the original Lorentz system. And you can see that the distances between the embedding and the, the original Lorentz system trajectory are again with one-to-one -one correspondence.
All right, to summarize uh, this local conformal autoencoder, uh, I hope is a motivation for using burst samplings in experimental science. I think currently the weak point is we don't have a lot of examples to use local on. So hopefully this will motivate you to design experiments with some perturbations in the latent space. And we have also shown that this neural network parameterization is a good ansatz for interpolation and extrapolation. Uh, specifically, it did better than the spectral method. And we're looking into multi-scale extension of this method, mainly at using bursts with different scales. And also we're looking at robust burst estimations. Uh, that is a way to estimate bursts from, from noisy data with uh, overlapping bursts. All right, I thank you very much for your time and please visit our paper if you want more information and use our code and uh, stay safe and have a nice week.